The International Christian Embassy Jerusalem is your embassy in the heart of Israel, founded in 1980. From our headquarters in Jerusalem through our branches in over 80 nations and yours in Canada, we seek to challenge the Church to take up its scriptural responsibility, to remind Israel of the promises made to her in the Bible, and to be a source of practical assistance to all the people in the land of Israel. On today's program, addressing the question, is Zionism inseparable from scriptures? A report about the Holocaust and anti-Semitism and reaching today's youth with the gospel and the truth. Hello, I'm Donna Holbrook, National Executive Director of the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem in Canada. Simcha Torah is rejoicing of and with the Torah is the Jewish holiday that celebrates and marks the conclusion of the annual cycle of the public Torah readings and the beginning of a new cycle. The Torah is the first five books in the Old Testament. This day follows Sukkot and the Feast of Tabernacles. Well, one Simcha Torah I will never forget. It happened following a classical concert at Christ Church inside Jaffa Gate in Old Jerusalem. Bobby, a tall blonde lady from Florida, didn't want to go back to the hotel room quite then, so I decided to see more of Jerusalem with her. Just then, two very tall, young, slender Hasidic men rushed by with big brim black hats and their side curls flying. We recognized them from our time in the city earlier as they translated Hebrew for us during a tour. These young men were from Brooklyn. Bobby went to greet them with a big hug, then realized that that would be wrong. We asked where were they going, and they said, we could follow them. Here we were, two North American blondes running after two young Jewish men half our age, further into the old city of Jerusalem, down and around stone passages. Picture that. We arrived further into the Jewish quarter at a synagogue without any roof. Men and women were divided by a chest-high wall where the men were dancing in a circle with the Torah scrolls, while the women did the same on their sides without the Torah. I was mesmerized by the men, the men's side, especially as I had never witnessed Simcha Torah. From my perspective, they appeared to be drunk in the spirit, but without drink. And from the women's side, I noticed a middle-aged woman sitting in awe. We spoke briefly, but she imparted that God had given her a vision or a dream that was so divine, so holy, that she could not even bring herself to speak about it. It appears God still talks to His people. God was the Jewish people's God's first. So as Christians, my hope is that we can all refrain from arrogance and personal judgment, because if God talked to His people before Christ came to this world, God will continue to talk to His people and to us who believe in Him. Bobby and I had to keep our eyes on our young men as we would have no clue how to return to one of the gates. We lost them but found ourselves following others out to the western wall, the Kotel, which was unlike the daytime. It was empty, perfectly clean, and quiet with the full moon above us. What an evening! Our first Simcha Torah I will never forget. Please join us for the rest of our program. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. To this he called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken words or by our letter. Hello and welcome to Inside Israel's panel discussion. Today we're discussing Faith and politics, are they inseparable with regards to Israel? Joining me on the panel, Julio Gabelli, Rod Hembry, and Adina Gabelli. I'm starting with you, Rod. Are they inseparable? When I was young, I, uh, <laughs> I actually, with my father who was a pastor, and my grandparents were pastors and all that, we come from a pastoral family, and they were always kind of carefully separating. And, uh, and that was interesting, and we would talk about it because the various party leaders were primarily believed in Christian 
uh, type of things. And so as we moved along, I noticed something that they, my dad especially, he began to get involved in politics a little bit because some of the party leaders were making decisions that were affecting. And I remember hearing a statement, David Maines made the statement. He said, you know what, I, I, I'm, I don't get involved in politics, but now I have to get involved because you're stepping on my ground. Mm -hmm. And what I found was that the interesting part of this is that politics is stepping in the society of religion. And Israel's a big part of that. Because Israel as a nation is a very important part of the end times, a very important part of everything. And the people are stepping into that. And, and I'm realizing now, you know, it's pretty hard not to because the problem is you've got to deal with this and you're dealing with situations that the party leaders are saying whatever they're saying or in other nations, the, the leaders of the nations are saying things that affect you. And I think that's part of what God is doing in the end times. Yes. So, you know, I, I've got to tell you that, yeah, I, I mean, there's some, you got to be careful, mm -hmm. but at the same time, no, there's, there's people who are stepping on my ground. You know, you've got everything out there. So I don't think you can really separate them anymore. You have to ask people, okay, we need to draw the lines and we need to say, where are the issues that are biblical? And we need to, to develop people in those areas. Roger, bring up some really interesting historic thoughts that I'd like you to pick up on because while you were speaking, I was thinking even of the history of our nations. We're based on a Judeo-Christian democracy yes, with right. certain principles of human rights, which we get from um, mankind being created in God's image. I mean, even the UN Declaration of Human Rights now is based on that. So it seems to be that inevitably it has not been separated, even though there are those That's that right. try to do it. It's stark. Well, I, I believe the uh, separation of church and state is a real deception. It's a strategy that the enemy has used to take God out of the political arena. And as believers, um, we should actually step into the political arena because we need to make very clear the Judeo-Christian value system, which is under attack mm -hmm. in our nation specifically. But in the context of Israel now, we cannot separate the two. It's clear to me that Israel is a prophetic fulfillment of a covenant that God made with Abraham. Mm -hmm. And on May the 14th, 1948, at approximately 4 p.m., the provisional government under, you know, uh, uh, Ben-Gurion, David yes. Ben-Gurion, mm -hmm. that, that, that state, that declaration of the statehood was the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And Israel is a nation that is spiritual, but also a fulfillment of what the scriptures actually teach. There's something I'd like to take you back with, though, because I don't want anybody putting words in your mouth when you say you can't separate church and state. There are those that will say, look, I don't, I don't um, support um, a state-run theocracy. Right. And I don't know when you say it can't be separated. I mean, the Constitution is based on a certain, uh, on the Judeo-Christian democracy, but you're not talking about a theocracy, are you, when you say it shouldn't be separated? No, I'm not speaking about a theocracy. I wanted that what to be I am clear. speaking about yeah. very simply is, understanding the role and the place of God yes. and the Judeo-Christian value system that we find in the scriptures. Our constitution is based on it. Adina? Um, as a young person, uh, I often go to Google for things uh, to find out. And I just want to go to the definition uh, of faith. What Google says is a complete trust or confidence in someone or something. And it gives the example this would restore one's faith in politician. It's funny that Google <laughs> puts the two together in the same sentence. Very funny. <laughs> and uh, I just think that, you know, we, we have to look at, at the biblical historical um, uh, view for Israel, where it is a covenant from God with the people and it's an eternal covenant. It doesn't change because times are changing. God will not change and he stays the same. It doesn't change like we change our minds. Um, and I think just looking at, at the leaders in, in the Jewish history, like Moses, for example, he was not just a spiritual leader, but a politician, I would say the greatest one. <laughs> and uh, it just really emphasizes and puts the value on, on the two, both faith and politics. Yes, yeah. well said. 
The interesting part about this is that, and it's fascinating that you say he was the greatest politician. That is amazing. And the idea of a politician is changing. The idea of, mm -hmm. it, it's all changing. I like what you said too. And the important part is that we have to realize that God doesn't have politician, mm -hmm. uh, spiritual leader, mm -hmm. he just has leaders. Now there was a kingly anointing and a priestly anointing that Samuel brings out in 1 Samuel, and that's very important with Saul and with Samuel. But it's important for us to recognize that God expected leaders to be people who understood him. And in Genesis chapter 9, there is the commission of the government given to Noah. And God says, mm -hmm. here's what it is. I don't want this happening and that happening. He gave responsibilities to Noah. And he says the same thing that he said to Adam, be fruitful and multiply. And spread out uh, about the earth. And make sure, and these are the things that are governmental. And so these governmental things in Genesis 9 have been slowly backed away by our leaders. And not all of them, but many of them. And we're, you know, it's important for us to try to bring them back. And Israel is the key issue. Yes. I believe it's the key issue because Israel is the nation, is God's nation. And uh, we've got to look at that. I, I'm always baffled when I look at even um, Israelis or Jews that say, you know, we, we don't want to get involved in religion, it's all about statehood. But when you look at their history of King David, Solomon, everything that has shown up in, in archaeological real findings, it's based on faith, yes. a faith tradition. It's based on the fact that these people were men of God, very strong faith believers that established a nation from back then. And yeah. They and it's the basis of their nationhood today. They made yeah. mistakes when David moved the ark. The first time he moved the ark, the yes. Uzziah touched it and he got killed. And David was upset and he put the ark aside. He obviously read the scripture and learned some more. And yes, then he said, he I figured it out. And so that's what God desires us to do. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting that within Israeli society, that tension is very real. Where you yes. have the secular Jews that have come out of former communist countries. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then you have the ultradox, orthodox. Uh, did I say ultradox? Yes. Maybe that's a new <laughs> word that I'm using. The ultra-orthodox, uh, yes. the Hasidic community, that there are a, a number of sects that do not even recognize the state of Israel because mm -hmm. they're still waiting for the Messiah to return to legitimize right. the actual state of Israel. So that tension is very real. Those that are focusing on faith and those that say, no, faith out of the way, let's just create a state that has nothing to do with faith. But you cannot do that with Israel. Once again, because biblically speaking, Israel is the prophetic fulfillment of a promise, of a covenant that God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I think the three of you have well backed that up, but then goes the final broader question. Can one really separate faith, <laughs> logically speaking, from anything because even the absence of religion is belief in no religion. Mm -hmm. Can one separate faith, separate faith from anything? I don't think you can. I mean, obviously, it, it, you know, it is question. what it is. You know, if you're a leader, you're going to be eventually going to go down to your personal beliefs. It's always that way. And, you know, that's what I say. Absolutely. Any final point, Adina? Um, I, I mentioned about Moses being the greatest leader, and yes. <clears throat> I wanted to, to point out that he wasn't just a mediator between people. You can read throughout the, their journey in the desert and the fights they would have, the quarrels between them, but he was a mediator between them and, and God, and yes. so many times he stood uh, before God and cried out for the people that yes, God would have right. the mercy. And I think as, as leaders in, in all spheres of, of life, if we are able to come to that place of just uh, mediating to God, crying out for, for the people, we're better off. So I don't think we can ever separate the two. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> and on that note, I'd like to thank the three of you for joining me. I think for me personally, um, I've been fortunate enough to travel to Israel a couple of times and I, I saw the impact that just the visit to the land made to me and also just revealing the truth of God's word to me you know, in, a, in a new way which I never really had a focus on. How do you think we can share this message to the younger generation which is 
bombarded by the news in, on many fronts, specifically regarding Israel and its enemies. Yeah. How do we we get to the bottom of the of this and actually get the spiritual news, in a sense, out to them, like the plans that God has for Israel? How do we do that? Well, I think I think firstly, how you do that, you you got to you got to focus on your target group. We can somehow get discouraged if we look at the whole field before us and, and we think, how are we going to attack this field? Uh, say it's a field of oranges, you know, you think I've got to harvest this whole thing. Oh, and here they are, you know, like acres of this stuff. And you think, how am I going to do this? Well, you're going to do it by focusing on the orange trees in front of you. The nearest to you, the easiest to get it, and the target that you can feed with truth. And for many of us in the church, that means getting hold of our young people in churches. It means actively engaging them and making sure that we have the truth of God's word firstly on our fingertips, that we can easily refer them to the pages of scripture by which they can be convinced. And you know what? This is one of the most exciting messages you could ever want to have. For young people, this is so exciting that they're living in a time when they've seen the fulfillment of biblical prophecy like no other generation. And the building up of Zion and the incredible fulfillment of the return of the Jews, you know, just from the land of the north, over a million. The Bible says it. And you can enthuse them and say, you know where this is going to end? This is going to end when Jesus puts his feet on the Mount of Olives. How lucky you are to see these things. And so you need to begin with the people in your sphere of influence. And you need to be well armed, well tooled, and you need to do it with energy and excitement. In other words, you need to be infectious. Psalm 144 verse 12. Let our sons in their youth be as grown-up plants, and our daughters as corner pillars, fashioned as for a palace. We're singing in Zulu. I, I, I didn't say that. You're singing in Zulu. Okay, now, we, we, you can tell your friends, I can speak a little Zulu now. But also, you're saying the message, hold on to Jesus. Now, what's missing? What's missing? We got to get our groove on. Hey, hey, hey. Okay, now, we gotta do our dance. Come on, come on, come on, let me see some dancing. Where are my dancers? Where are my dancers? Hey, South Africa in the house. Okay, now they're gonna show you how to do it. Come on, here we go. One, two. Next, a report about the Holocaust and anti-Semitism. Genesis chapter 12, when Abraham was receiving the call from God to be a nation and to establish the Jewish people, God called him and he says, Behold, I will go, I'm going to bless you. You shall be a blessing and I will make you a great nation. And then he says in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, he says, And through you, Abraham, and through your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. 
That means God has chosen the Jewish people to become a vehicle of blessing for human mankind. It is very similar to what Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verse 1, where he asks, what is the benefit of being Jewish? He says, much in many ways, because to them the oracles of God has been committed. That means, in a way, we can say the Jewish people gave to human mankind the word of God. Paul says they gave us the covenants. They gave us the belief in the one true God in heaven and the creator of the heavens and the earth. And of course, Paul also says, through them also Messiah, according to the flesh, came into this world. Therefore, I do believe that anti-Semitism at its very root is actually a demonic power upon our world and probably the most powerful demonic power. Because if Satan will succeed to annihilate the Jewish people, he will be able to frustrate the plans of God with humanity. He will be able to wipe away the people group which God called to be a blessing for human mankind. To wipe away this people which God says, through you I will bless the whole world. To wipe away the people which gives the word of God to human mankind and which gave them the Messiah and the Bible tells us one day they will bring a, an, an usher, a kingdom of peace, a millennium messianic kingdom upon this world where Jerusalem, this very city, is the capital of it. That's why the enemy, Satan, he hates Jerusalem and he hates the Jewish people and therefore throughout century he tried to kill the seed of Abraham because he understood if he is able to kill the seed of Abraham, he is able also to destroy the salvation plans of God with human mankind. So it is a demonic force which is driving people, people like Adolf Hitler, which is driving people like Pharaoh and Haman to wipe out the Jewish people. But thanks God they never succeed because we are serving an almighty God. He is the one who keeps his people and he is the one who also watches over his people day and night. But never Nevertheless, we have to take the challenge of anti-Semitism very serious. It is even a very powerful force in our world today. And the newspapers of this week, they actually say that all across Europe, new anti-Semitic parties and forces are rising up and they're becoming a powerful political force in Europe. And if you look to the Holocaust in our German history, we see even that some of the key theologians in Germany, they have been deceived by this demonic teaching of anti-Semitism and they became collaborators of Adolf Hitler. And therefore we need to learn a lesson today and we have to ask ourselves what prevents us as Christians actually to commit the same crimes? What are the lessons of the Holocaust? What we can learn? And follow me to the following place which teaches us how to avoid the traps of anti-Semitism in the very time in which we are living today. It is here at Yad Vashem where we have to ask ourselves the question, how can we protect our lives from the dangers of anti-Semitism? How can we protect our hearts and our minds from this demonic deception which uh, deceived millions of people throughout history? First of all, I believe it is important for us to understand the severe consequences as we turn ourselves against the Jewish people. The Bible describes the Jewish people as the apple of God's eye. And he says in the prophet Zechariah chapter 2, he says, if you touch my people, if you touch Israel, you are actually touching the apple of God's eye. And that's a very dangerous place to be. It's like what God said to Abraham. He says, I will bless those who bless thee, but I will also curse those who are cursing you as a nation. So in a way it's a stern warning from God that if we touch the Jewish people, if we talk bad about them, if we are portraying stereotypes about them which are not true, we are actually are dealing with God. Secondly, it's important for us to understand the biblical truth about the Jewish people. They are called by God and the Bible tells us that he made an eternal covenant with them. So to turn against the Jewish people, actually we are turning ourselves against the covenants of God. And that's why the Christian embassy exists and that's why there are many institutions around the world which do speak the truth about Israel.
Israel. And that's also why Yad Vashem exists to inform the nations, inform pastors around the world about the very dangers of anti-Semitism and of the dangers of, of turning against the Jewish people. But then thirdly, it is important for us to have a sharpened conscience. That means that our inner heart is constantly in an attitude that we realize that there is something wrong in our society or in our country. And the conscience of the German people to a large degree wasn't sharp enough. And they didn't react in the way how they should have reacted. But I was very touched some years ago by the testimony of a woman from a little village in France. It was called Chambaud sur Lyon. It's a village which was recognized by Yad Vashem here as the entire village being righteous among the Gentiles. The reason why this village was recognized by Yad Vashem uh, to receive this amazing status was that, this, was that the entire village decided to stand up on behalf of the Jewish people and they saved the lives of more than 5,000 Jews and other people which were persecuted during the Holocaust. And I remember well visiting that village some years ago, uh, seeing a film about the inhabitants of that village, village as they were being saving uh, the Jewish people and afterwards they were asked by a journalist and one old lady was being asked by the journalist why did you do what you did why did you risk your life to help Jewish people and in an almost surprised way she turned to the journalist and she said isn't this what we are supposed to do and I, real, I realized that this woman actually, she had a sharpened conscience. She knew in her heart that helping the Jewish people, helping the needy, helping those who are persecuted, this is what we as Christians are supposed to do. We conclude our program today with some sights and sounds within Israel. Thank you for joining us today and be sure to visit our website at www.icejcanada.tv or call us at 1-866-324-9133. One hundred percent of what we receive from you toward a project goes to that designation. Through your contribution to ICEJ Canada, you can participate by giving to Haifa Home for Holocaust Survivors, Women at Risk Red Carpet Project, Operation Life Shield Bombproof Shelters, Shoulder to Shoulder Alias Support, Bet Singer Children's Home, Israel in Crisis, ICEJ Communication Media Fund, Christian Friends of Yad Vashem, Megan David Adam Emergency Services, Canada Israel Young Adult Scholarship, Equip and Teach, Bet Rachel Strauss Inclusive Community, Gift Estate and Securities Funds.